So welcome, Andrew and Ralph. All right. Great, thank you. Uh, so, hi everyone, I'm Andy Randall, so I'm a, a product manager at uh, Microsoft, and I work mainly on uh, Linux technologies within the Azure organization. And I'm Ralph Scolacci, I'm a product manager in Azure Core Upstream, which is next to, not Andy's group. And so Andy specializes in Linux and Linux technologies and so forth at Microsoft, and I specialize in open source application infrastructure, so uh, containers and Kubernetes and WebAssembly. So first of all, we're going to start with why would we even bother with WebAssembly? Now, a lot of people here are Docker experts, a lot of people are Kubernetes experts, a lot of people are Linux experts here. But one of the interesting things is we have to sort of figure out what the space is. Like, why would we even talk about WebAssembly web here? And the answer is because for 10 years, we've learned a lot about containers. They're fantastic, right? But we now know that they can be too big. People don't have enough time to go ahead and do it, right? Yeah, I'm going to just yep, point at you and you click, right? They are also tied to a particular architecture. So you've got to recompile or have multiple versions of something depending on the architecture that you're going for. They're also tied to operating system. Now, no, most people here would normally be using Linux in some way, and so they don't really think that there's another operating system or that there are other operating systems. There's also Windows, because I'm from Microsoft, but there are many operating systems that don't have containers or that kind of infrastructure on them. And those are also great computing platforms. So there's no particular reason we should ignore them, for example. But finally, the thing about Docker is that you know, the container ecosystem brought along the VM and native metaphor, which is the idea that you could make re new use of code that always assumed, even whether it was 10 or 20 year old code, it assumed an entire control command operating system that it can manipulate as it wanted to. And as we've discovered over the last, in particular, the last five years, that turns out to be a, a, an obstacle in a lot of cases. We don't want all code, some code, but not all code requires a full direct access to an operating system which containers gave us. So what are we doing about that? Well, WebAssembly is a thing, but we got to take it a little bit seriously. And, and so I'm just going to go over this. Caleb, raise your hand. Was, uh, he did a great WebAssembly 101 a couple hours back right here. And if you want to dig into it a little bit more, find the video or just better yet, tackle them outside the door and have them do the whole presentation all over again. But basically, a few short bullet points to get us going. One is that WASM and WebAssembly, that's the same thing. The assembly part, it's not really an assembler language, but it's a language that looks a lot like assembly because it's sort of an assembly-ish format that um, closely models machine code. And so it's easy to parse and convert directly to machine code. It's one of the reasons it's very fast. By default, it has a very secure sandbox model because it was built in the web, right, WebAssembly. It comes from the browser ecosystem. And so in the browser ecosystem, which is one of the most heavily attacked surfaces uh, in software, it had to have a very secure sandbox. So you can mathematically prove in advance of a deployment that uh, the sandbox and a module will not have a breakout in it, and which is... Uh, uh, amazing thing. Most languages compile to it, multi-language. That's sort of a check mark you have to have in the modern world. Uh, obviously, you can put pretty much any language inside of a container, and you've got to maintain that. So you've got to bring that along. It also runs on almost all you know, modern mainstream operating systems and architectures because it was built in the browser, and the browser ecosystem had to put a browser on every operating system you could find. And those operating systems would be built on different architectures. And so it turns out that because of the, the work that had been done by browsers, WebAssembly, no matter where it is, inside or outside of the browser, actually has this ability to execute everywhere, uh, pretty much, right? And finally, it's got very small size, right? You can compile down, it is essentially very close to assembly, not assembly, but very close. So the size is extremely small depending on the workload, and it can start super fast. Not as fast as native, but strangely, there are some weird edge cases where it actually can be made to start faster and be more performant than native. Those are edge cases, but it, the fact that it can do that at all in any case is really amazing. So to give you an example from a feature sense, go ahead and start the video. This is just in a Kubernetes cluster. So what I'm trying to do is give you a sense for why WebAssembly is actually useful. This is an AKS, could be any Kubernetes cluster. 
And we've got a bunch of node pools here. But you'll notice that one of the node pools is Windows on AMD. So great, fantastic. One of the node pools is Linux on an AMD architecture. And we also have a node pool that is Linux on an ARM. So this is very heterogeneous. And in normal case, a single container will not run on all of these nodes. You'd have taints, tolerations, labels, the whole ball of wax, right? So in fact, if we deploy Azure Voting, which is the two, it's like the Kubernetes, the CNCF voting app. It's got a back end and a front end. And we notice that depending on where it got automatically deployed to, we don't have a multi-arch build. We don't have a multi os build here. And so it only deploys on the two Linux AMD nodes successfully. Now, that's normal for us. But if we take a WebAssembly, you'll notice it's exactly the same. Um, Duffy, there'll be a test afterwards to see what was different. You should have noticed it. If we deploy, uh, deploy a WebAssembly application in Kubernetes, five replicas, you'll notice they're all running right away. But look at the nodes. Doesn't care. And it's one module. This is the same deployment. It just deployed wherever, no taints, no tolerations. You saw the YAML. And to prove that that's useful, like that we're not lying about it, watch what Kubernetes does if we go ahead and deploy and delete one of the Linux node pools. Right? Go ahead and delete the node pool. And we walk up here. You can see it's terminating already. We wait for a second. And there it goes. And it all redeploys. I cut it short there, but you can see it redeploy very quickly. And we'll prove it again by deploying, by deleting the other Linux nodes. Now we only have Windows nodes. And what happens? The containers are all done, right? But the web assemblies are all fine. I have just used Kubernetes native abilities to redeploy, OK? Now Duffy's squinting, so I know he's really focused here. How is this working? Um, we have just redeployed from Linux ARM and Linux AMD to Windows. And most people here at KubeCon will probably think, OK, but I'd really rather redeploy from Windows to Linux. The point here is, it doesn't matter. You can now actually have the application be the same application right, for any of those things. And suddenly, Kubernetes almost becomes a PaaS. Not quite. It's still Kubernetes. But you don't have to, as a developer, care which node you ran it on. You just have to build one thing. That's really cool. So where is this great, right? So now we can talk about this. The opt-in security stance, by default, denies access to anything on the operating system. That's for people who care about zero days. Anyone who's going to be closer to hardware calls, right? Anyone wanting to skip the container epic entirely. There are people who want, who are low, slow on the cloud native trail, and they're like, can we get past it? Did I wait long enough? We actually talk to those people. Portability. You can see that Kubernetes can become, in a sense, nodeless. You can now opt into that 30% ARM SKU savings without rebuilding all your containers every time. You can just say, yes, I want 30% less cost, or a, a smaller SKU. And there's OS support where there are no containers. In theory, you, if Kubernetes runs there, right, you could actually make it work. Size is important for network, storage, and memory costs. They all go down, right? And size is fantastic. The changes can be on the order of 10x to 100x, and I've even seen 200 times smaller than the original container. But it really, again, depends on the language and the workload. And fast cold starts, we've got a new wave of serverless. Kubernetes can become more lively. It can be more active, closer to a real-time reactive oper uh, operating system, distributed operating system, than it is with just containers. And in IoT, you can add performance to very constrained environments, because things are so much smaller, and they start a lot faster. The network connection can be flakier or less robust, and you can still deploy in a normal way. So finally, just a couple of high-level things. Kubernetes can reach more places, and it can be used as a scheduler, not just as an orchestrator. Right? You can do more. You can take places where there's a lot of artisanal code because it was hard to reach, and make that a cloud-native uh, uh, workflow with um, using a cloud-native binary, not a cloud-native operating system, for example. And Docker files become less necessary, even if containers are the core workload of Kubernetes and the data center cloud. And in short, if anybody is old enough to remember the Java promise, 
My take is you write once and run maybe 75% of the places. But all of the chips in these buildings, all of the chips in our pockets is a vastly larger compute space than all the chips we have in data center. Now, Andy has a different bet. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier. I said you should put 95%, but that's the difference between you know, a marketing guy and the guy that actually understands the technology. Um, but in theory, I mean, you know, this is built anywhere you can run a browser, anywhere, you know, WebAssembly runs in every browser, runs in pretty much any environment. So I think in terms of the way we're thinking about cloud native, it kind of is right, right once run anywhere, but, uh, wow. but Ralph, Ralph won't let me, let me say that. And another way of putting this is, you know, it is the original promise of Java combined with the value proposition of Docker. Yeah, that, that's a good way of thinking about it. Again, I, I wouldn't get so excited, but Andy is very excited. But sounds great, right? Not so fast, not so fast. Sure, Wasm's great, but it's still hard to fun all, find all these little runtimes, all these little Wasm tools. They're all new. They're appearing. They're disappearing. And even if you find them, right, even if you find them, you've got to run the infrastructure underneath it. How do you get things updated? And how do you fix things and so forth? It turns out that's hard. So go ahead and click one more time because you've got to run production stuff. You've got to manage and deploy a fleet at scale. We know how to do this with containers. How do you do that with these fancy WebAssembly to prevent drift and maintain security? This gets a little bit hard, right? So, Ralph, these all sound like things I've heard before. I think if I kind of cast my mind back 10 years, if only we could like get into a time machine and like go back 10 years and think about how did they solve these challenges with containers? Because these challenges were all there with containers as well. So we're going to go do that and think about what did the world look like when containers first came on the scene? Well, the first thing is Docker itself didn't invent the concept of containers. They existed before all of the building blocks were there, but Docker created this fantastic user experience around it that made it usable, that's what made it take off. So having that in place was super important. The other was we knew how to build containers on a single node. But in practice, if you want to build an application at scale, you needed to build a cluster. How do you manage a cluster of nodes or running containers? Well, you know, we know today the answer is Kubernetes. There was some discussion around that at the time. But uh, today, that's done using Kubernetes. And you know, that came out really very quickly after um, containers first hit the, hit the scene with Docker. And then you had this question of standardization. You know, Docker defined a model which everyone loved, but it was very much a vendor-specific implementation. And due to various industry pressures, we created an, an industry um, consortium around that and a standard to define what it means to be a container uh, within the OCI. And then the other thing was in the early days, containers were all built on general purpose operating systems. And one of the things that uh, the core OS founders realized was you could build a container-optimized Linux and not have to use a general purpose one. Now, what do we mean by that, or what did they mean by it at the time? There's a number of things. The first thing is, if you've got all your dependencies packaged in a container, you don't need them in the underlying operating system. So you can take out 95% of the packages that you have there, just keep the, th the things you need to run containers and deploy the containers on top of that. So you have a minimal distribution, reduces the surface area of, for any attacks. The second is, you can make that operating system immutable. So the actual file system that the operating system is installed on it cannot be modified at runtime. And this has a bunch of security advantages as well as manageability. You want declarative provision. You want to treat your nodes as cattle, not pets. So you want to have config files that defines what nodes look like, and then you can arbitrarily scale your deployments. And the last thing is you want these nodes, if you're going to manage them at scale, you can't go around manually SSHing into each node and doing a node-by-node -node update. Those updates have to be automatic. And, and I see, I see uh, various friends in the audience who were at CoreOS who've probably given this pitch to customers 100 times or more. Um, but that was the pitch, and it took off. It was very successful. And in fact, you know, the, the original idea for CoreOS was the very first container-optimized oper um, container operating system but it derived from work that Google had already done making the laptop scalable in the same way with Chromium OS. Um, so you saw Google um, introduce the same concept with their container-optimized OS. 
Uh, Red Hat came out with Atomic Host, then they acquired CoreOS and merged those two things together. And then uh, the team that's now my team within Microsoft took the original CoreOS and forked that, and that became Flatcar Container Linux. Uh, AWS came out with their own uh, Linux and for containers. And within Azure, we have a thing called Azure Linux that you can run AKS nodes on as, as well. So there's a whole ecosystem of these kind of optimized um, uh, Linuxes for containers. So that's where we were with, with containers 10 years ago. Where's the operating, where's the ecosystem looking today? It's not as smooth, shall we say. Go ahead and click. So we're going to use the same schema that, that Andy had introduced with the container evolution. We started with limited compilers and languages, and I would say even one year ago, this was still true. We have not reach, reached a full developer UX. We now have VS Code extensions. Every uh, app service has their own developer environment. They're not unified at a kind of generic level. So we do have dwarf, dwarf support generally, but it depends on language, things like this, right? So it's not a full developer UX. I would go a little greener than my kind of orange checkbox here, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and move on to uh, w the progress from in-browser only. As we've mentioned, the WebAssembly started in the browser environment. Um, we do now have a ton of general purpose, open source, well-maintained runtime environments. A whole bunch of WebAssembly runtimes are available. It's relatively easy to build a runtime for WebAssembly because of the design of the, and the specification. It's very clear. There's a lot of good source code to reuse and so forth. So that's actually a darker green, I think, really, at this point. Um, if we go from, like, say, hey, you've got a couple implementations in browsers, we now have industry standards. Uh, this is the WebAssembly. Um, the icon is really supposed to be like a, a puzzle piece or something like that. Um, and those, are, those standards for core WebAssembly are in the W3C. The un, uh, oncoming component work that allows interoperation between languages and runtimes across the entire ecosystem is entering um, various, sta various stages in the W3C. And so that'll eventually be a W3C spec as well. So with that ecosystem support and the standards, this is probably a more of a green. It may be like the kind of soft green that I have up above. So we're getting better. And then I think we've got this one, but gosh, this one, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So this is the point where Ralph gave me a call about six months ago and said, we have this gap in the ecosystem. I'd love to work out how we can make uh, WASM easier for folks to adopt and build something that just works out of the box as a WASM-optimized OS in the same way that CoreOS was a container-optimized OS. So, um, so we decided, let's do this. Let's build a Linux just for WASM. And we, of course, decided to do that on Flatcar. Why would we do that? Well, um, it's a community-driven project. So we wanted the results from this work to be something that was out in the community that everyone could adopt. Uh, and Flatcar is actually going through the process of being submitted into the CNCF right now. So it's, it ticks that box. Um, Flatcar is already widely adopted. We weren't picking some immature technology that no one used or understood how it worked. It was already pretty widely out there in the, in the, in the wild. Um, something we've added recently to Flatcar uh, was this ability to build uh, modular builds so you can customize how you deploy the operating system with additional layers. And we're going to get into this in a lot more detail. And you know, the last point, just to be honest, you know, we had a team we, who knew it, and uh, we could collaborate and actually get this done uh, pretty quickly. So let's make it a little bit real. So we'll talk about the process here. So Andy alluded to the modular layer build uh, system. We're going to talk about building individual layers and then baking that into an immutable image. Those are familiar with CoreOS. This, this talk will all be like, oh, yeah, been there, done that. Um, but it's a great idea, so we're still doing it, but with different tooling. So first, you're going to create layers that have your things. This is creating a file layer, right? Um, and that layer will have one or more tools from the ecosystem, right? It doesn't matter. I'm talking about WebAssembly, but this could be any specialized system. You could use this same mechanism to build, say, a Python ML research distribution that only has those tools, for example. But all the operational stuff I show you here would be directly applicable to that as well. So think of it in a larger sense, but we're using WebAssembly as the example that I'm motivated by. So you push your layers to storage accounts, 
And those can be used on an initial boot. Initial boot, the, some, the, the operating system reaches out, grabs the layer, comes in, unifies it with the base OS image, and then that becomes the immutable image that, it, that is run. So you get to configure what you want. You can create, to do that, you create an ignition file. Think of this as a configuration manifest. I want these things to be pulled in on initial boot and not other things, and I want them to be placed here and not there. You're going to deploy locally with a neato script trick, which I'm going to show you. Um, but then when you get to a production quality, obviously that would be in the cloud and so forth. And most importantly, you're going to have some fun because you can do this with anything. But I'm giving you a WebAssembly because I think it's really, really cool. And if you're interested and convinced by my pitch, then you'll go and try this out, right? And it'll make it easier for you to do. So quick digression about layers for everybody who, for example, might be watching this or watch later and you're not really cl clear with layers, you might uh, want to be able to move one tool in with one layer. Go ahead and click. When you build the image, that WASM time layer will slide right into the location that you wanted it at. And so eventually when it executes, you'll, your user bin might look like that. Click. So if you want to follow along, there's the repo that has all these recipes. If you're going to bake the stuff, now we need to make a layer, right? Going to clean stuff, download stuff, play stuff. But if you notice, that's pretty much what a Docker file does, right? And in fact, that last one, creating a raw layer file, is pretty much Docker build, right? OK, yeah, upload your raw file to an endpoint that your distro can reach. That's pretty much Docker push, right? So here's my Docker pushes. This is uh, Azure Blobs. It can be like S3, whatever it might be. Doesn't matter. But as long as it can be reached, you can select any number of those things and mix and match them to your heart's content. If you're interested about this, go look at the repo. This is the list. Now, when you're building your image, you got three, four, five pieces of bread you want to put. You put them in your ignition file. That gives the bread you love. This is an example. The very simple one. We're going to load the file called Lunatic. So WebAssembly that uses kind of Erlang actor style. That tells us we're going to do it. This particular demo is in WSL. So it's a little bit slower than in native Linux. If you're in native Linux, anything with QEMU, this trick will work. Go ahead and click, and we'll run the demo. What you're doing here is grabbing the image, copying it into the local directory, and then you're going to execute the uh, image with uh, the uh, recipe for Lunatic, the one you just saw. I'm going to have to go ahead and do this. And then it, the script that we loaded basically kicks the whole thing off locally using QEMU rather than the cloud. If you're familiar with cloud and cloud inits, uh, custom metadata and so forth, you can run the cloud that way. And so right here, we're all loading up. This is first boot. And we're going to get to about eight, nine seconds. And then it'll freeze. And it freezes because it's now building, it's taken the layer, and it's building the layer onto the base image, making it immutable, and then it's going to release the image into uh, execution. Now, right there, it takes a little bit longer. You can see it jumps forward a couple of minutes. That's the WSL lag. All of you here in native Linux will be like eight seconds. So here, we've got, we booted in. We can go ahead and type lunatic. And sure enough, it's there. Go ahead and click through. Now, to make this solid, you can put it in the cloud. You can do it in private cloud, private environments, and so forth. But you need to update it securely. Now, the actual underlying uh, base uh, Flatcar OS image, we have a tool called Nebraska for doing this, which uh, is an update server built on the same mechanism for Chromium. And it allows you to, basically, you have two partitions, the running partition, and then you upload the new version into the B partition, and you can switch from one to the other. And if it fails, you can roll back. So it's, uh, and, and then you have policy and uh, auditing controls so you can view what's actually happening across the cluster. So for the underlying OS, we have a great uh, set of tools there. So notice he said that, remember, the updating is the base image. And we're talking about, go ahead and click through. We're going to actually show you the update. When, down here, we cleared up, and we've installed Wasm time. And we've also used Ignition to configure a reach out for an update of Wasm time only in one minute. So we've gone through about 10, 20 seconds, and we keep looking at the version. This part is very boring. It's not an active demo. But remember, 
When we get to one minute, and this is real time, I haven't crunched it down, so it really will take one minute, which is great because apparently that's all we have, right? At one minute, system D will reach out to that same endpoint and check the, the uh, SHA list and see if there is a match for an update for WASM time for this architecture. It's even architecture specific. And when it finds that, we'll see systemd dump out some D message stuff because we're all running as root. Because it's immutable. We don't need users. So right about now, boom. Now if I do WASM version, you notice we've updated to the, conveniently to the new version that is also there. And that's how it works. Go ahead and click through. And we should mention, yep. So what we got to do is how to play, uh, what we want to do is the call to action, standard you know, stuff, which really means please do this and see what you think. Right? This is how to play with Flatcar and Wasm together. Go to those repos. Go ahead and modify the image using those techniques. There's a prod Flatcar and a dev Flatcar, so you can see different kinds of usage. Go ahead and push new layers for yourself to use or as PRs and read about Flatcar and the ignition configuration process. If you like what you see, hopefully any of you can submit PRs back to the same repo in Flatcar upstream and make your recipe part of the ecosystem itself. Yep, and the thing I wanted to mention there is this update mechanism for system extensions. We're looking at uh, integrating that into the Nebraska experience as well, so you can kind of manage across both the, the SysX layers and the underlying OS layer. So, um, yeah, try it out, because this is something that we're building for the community. We want to drive community adoption of uh, WebAssembly, and, uh, yeah, we hope you enjoy it. Thank you. All right, any, any questions? Since we're basically doing a bot, Docker build and we're basically doing a Docker push, can we push those WASM layers to an OCI registry? To my knowledge, the, okay, let, let's do that thing. So we don't have to repeat the question now. Yeah, yeah. so uh, in fact, um, WebAssembly, are, are support, WebAssembly itself, modules and then in, in the future iteration components and the meta, metadata that goes with them will be and are now available in OCI registries. So you can push and pull WebAssembly modules right now. This particular mechanism of updating doesn't support OCI API right now, but there's no reason it can't be upgraded to do that. So that's actually a great feature to have and add to the systemd checking mechanism. Um, but we don't have it right now. Yeah, um, yeah uh, just to clarify, so that, that mechanism is part of System D, right? So it's the upstream System D project that implements the system extensions. So it, it's System D that's actually doing the HTTP pull of the, of the layers. So, I mean, we're very active in that project, but kind of that's, that's where that interaction has to happen. Any other questions? Um, this looks great. Uh, seeing all the uh, benefits of the WASM runtime, uh, especially the security, and seeing that the performance is great, uh, do you think in the future it will just replace the Docker containers as we know them to get today? Uh, easy question. <laughs> the, the question that we always hear all the time. Um, did anybody replace VMs when we got containers, really? Do VMs like not get used anymore? Right, right. No, it, in fact, the, so the, the various technical aspects, and I'll even back up the fur, uh, further. Really, this is all engineering, right? And so every time we take a, t a technology step, with, like whether it's WebAssembly or containers, we take a step that helps a certain category of behavior, right? But we actually still run some things on VMs because it's actually better run in VMs. And so what you're going to see is obviously every technology has a feature set that creates some new opportunities and some evolution of current stuff. But at the same time, there are real reasons to run containers. So if you ask me, like my short answer is, no, 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 look, in Kubernetes, in big data centers, and when you've got a lot of computing power and so forth, you will, if you migrate to WebAssembly, you'll get, a, like, you can use smaller SKUs, and it'll be more agile and the whole thing. But the real question is, like, how hard do you have to work to get there for the particular feature? In most Kubernetes scenarios, containers are going to remain the, the vast majority of the workload. That's the answer. 
But we're talking about WebAssembly being able to take Kubernetes to places where containers are actually hard. And so actually, that's the way you need to think about it, is an expansion of both Kubernetes and containers into areas where just containers and Kubernetes don't really fit the engineering setup. All right, and that's all, all we have time for. So thank you, Andy and Ralph. <laughs>